All right, thank you all for joining us. My name is Mary Kate Harrison and I work at the Arkansas Alumni Association. So thank you for tuning in for our Lunch and Learn series today. Um, today we are fortunate enough to have Ms. Kay Goss who is going to be presenting for us. She is a lecturer, author, and public servant and her expertise in emergency management, risk communication, and general resili resili <laughs> I'm sorry, resiliency have made her a highly respected authority throughout the world. After earning a bachelor's and master's in political science here at the University of Arkansas, she served as senior assistant for the intergovernor, intergovernor I'm sorry, I can't talk today, intergovernmental relations for Governor Bill Clinton and was the first woman to hold the position of assistant director of the Federal Emergency Management Agency in charge of national preparedness, training, and exercises. Today, she's going to talk about how the U of A changed her life and prepared her for a successful career what's involved in becoming an emergency manager, and what it's like being the only woman in a room. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Ms. Kay Goss. Thank you, Mary Kay, and thanks for everybody for joining us. It's uh, uh, fun to always talk about the importance of the University of Arkansas and uh, to be connected to Fayetteville, Arkansas. I love it the best. I was born in the city. Uh, my several generations before me came to uh, Northwest Arkansas because on my father's side, they wanted my aunt to go to University Studies High School. And uh, so we bought a farm, they bought a farm six miles from the campus. And uh, my aunt was, uh, she was taught by Congressman Jim Trimble. He was the Congressman before Congressman Hammerson. And uh, she dated Brooks Hayes, who later became a congressman from uh, central Arkansas. And uh, so she, <laughs> Jim Trimble, who was our congressman there, was her math teacher. So, uh, but most important of all, she met, for those of us with Fulbright College connections, she met uh, Senator Fulbright at that time when he was also a high school student. And uh, if you are driving around Fayetteville and you come to Porter Road, it's named after my aunt and her husband. So my father was uh, an engineer and worked for Southwest Bell in Oklahoma City. And uh, he had a national security job, national security in communications for the army. And uh, so he retired and uh, moved to Northwest Arkansas to take care of his aging parents. And they had a farm that was next door to my mother's farm. And then they started dating and married. And uh, so I'm kind of a product of uh, Springdale, Tiny Town, as well as Fayetteville. And uh, my dad was kind of a community hero because. Uh, he had this national security experience, which was quite unusual for our community, and uh, had traveled across the country with that for Southwestern Bell. And uh, so he became like chair of the school board, uh, judge of the elections, Sunday school superintendent. Um, and was very active in the Farm Bureau and was elected by the farmers in a four or five county area, Northwest Arkansas to serve on the natural resources uh, board with the connected to USDA. Anyway, he took me to all of his meetings as I was growing up. And I quickly decided by the time I was eight that I wanted to be one of those people who was active with or knowledgeable of what was going on publicly. Uh, in the government, uh, rather than my next door neighbors who had not a clue about or any interest in anything that was going on, but they were always subjected to the rules and the laws and the decisions that the people in the public sector made. So I said, hmm, I want to be over there in the public sector. So I've never had any interest really in private sector. I am very supportive of nonprofit work but government sector is my love. So 
what should I do? So I decided to take every course I could. Yeah, junior high school, high school, I had any choices. It was always world history, American history, American government, everything that I could take in that line. And uh, I was very big to communicate uh, by postal service. It's one of the reasons why I'm such an advocate of full funding of the postal service. I was subscribing to the National Geographic and I cut out every coupon that had some reference to some tourist attraction somewhere. So I was always getting more mail than my parents did because that they would send me these materials. And then I eventually decided uh, when I was about nine that I wanted to collect postcards from every state capital. So I sent out the, all of those uh, requests and got all those postcards coming in and started collecting stamps and everything. Anyway, long story short, always interested in the public sector. And uh, my mother was a nurse and she got me a job as a nurse's aide when I was in high school. I think I was 16 at the time. And uh, she was talking to me about becoming a nurse and I kind of liked it because I liked the idea of helping people. But uh, I got some blood spilled on me at the hospital on accident. And it just it made me sick of my stomach. So I decided, no, I stick with my public service. <laughs> and uh, so I did a lot of things. I was kind of a party girl. And uh, I went to all the football games, basketball games, and uh, was on the cheering squad and uh, glee club. So I go to the U of A. And uh, I'm going to major in government. And uh, the chairman of the government department was introduced and said, all the students uh, who major, want to major in government can, uh, can go with Dr. Alexander. And he stood up and he looked like an old time British prime minister. And there were no other students that wanted to major in government. And so it kind of freaked me out. I thought, what will I talk to him about? So I waited in the next, uh, chairman that was introduced was history and it was Robert Reeser and he looked really fun and friendly so I went as a history major but history I love history and uh, I appreciated the classes and uh, and took lots of notes and and met some wonderful other students there uh, some of whom that I'm really close with still to this day because they helped me through the class and uh, so eventually I decided I'm going to take a class with Dr. Alexander, but I don't want him to know my name because I don't want him calling on me to answer questions because I was at that time, unlike now, I was really shy. So I sat at the back of the room as far away from him as I possibly could. And uh, everything worked out fine the first day because he called on a lot of people, but he didn't call on me. And the second day, he brought a fan from home and put it by my chair. And he said, Miss Collay, if you're going to sit back here at the back of the room, at least you need to have a little oxygen. So I thought, well, yeah, okay. He knows who I am. And I kind of like him. So uh, I made an A in the class, and I took five classes with him. So after um, a little while, he asked me if I would be interested in working for the Department of Government Political Science. And I said, yes, yes, I would. And so he made me departmental secretary. And uh, so that's how I paid for the rest of my college. And also um, learned a lot about the management of a department. And he was teaching me how to eventually become a departmental chairman. And uh, I wrote my thesis, which uh, the university published, uh, a lot co-authored with uh, Dr. Alexander. So he taught me how to write a book. And uh, it was kind of interesting because after I graduated, I became an instructor, but it was just during summers. And I had a job, a full-time job at West Art Community College in Fort Smith, um, which is now the University of Arkansas at Fort Smith. 
a lot of other short jobs like um, research director for the Constitutional Convention of Arkansas to rewrite the state constitution. And uh, I uh, also taught some classes for some professors at UALR. In between the time I was teaching my classes at West Ark, I would drive back and forth between Fort Smith and Little Rock. And all of this was like sort of when you look back on it, it was preparing me for later without having in advance a plan. But I worked as hard as I could and learned as much as I could at every step of the way. So uh, kind of being uh, hyperactive in that respect. So Dr. Alexander passed away in 1969 and Max Milam was chairman of the political science department at the time and he asked me to come back to the university and take his place. I was away at the time working on my PhD and had done all my coursework and had passed my exams, uh, foreign language exams, and uh, but I had not written my dissertation. So my professor and I decided that I would do a dissertation on why the 1969-70 constitutional conventions proposed new constitution failed and the 1979-80 constitute, proposed constitution passed. And then in 1980, the voters of Arkansas defeated it as well. And so we sort of laughed and said, nobody on earth would be interested in finding out why Arkansas defeated proposed constitutions two times in a row. So we dropped that. And by that time, I had moved to Washington to work for Ray Thornton. I'd taken a leave of absence from the U of A. And uh, the dean at that time was uh, Robin Anderson. And uh, he said, okay, uh, you know, we hate to see you leave. We're afraid you won't come back, but you do need to get this interest in government and politics out of your system, which I thought was kind of interesting thing to say to somebody who was teaching government and politics. But anyway, just, you know, don't be discouraged, whatever anyone says to you. <laughs> if you're interested in the area, go for it. And, uh, so I went to Washington and helped uh, Congressman Thornton set up his office. When we got there, the congressman that served before Congressman Thornton was refusing to leave his office. So we had no place to go. So we went to Congressman Mills and he was in the same building. And of course the Dean of the delegation. So, you know, uh, here's our situation. He said, oh, don't worry about it. You can have my annex office. So for many months, we worked out of Mr. Mills' annex office. And uh, Mr. Mills' uh, chief of staff was Gene Goss. And so during the first year we were there, his wife passed away. And the second year we were there, we started dating. And the third year we were there, we got married. And the fourth year we were there, we had a daughter. So that's kind of how I became, you know, Mrs. Goss instead of Kay Colay. And uh, that service in Congress was very helpful in so many different ways. One, um, Congressman Thornton wanted to be on appropriations. Congressman Mills, as chairman of Ways and Means, had the power to name new members of Congress to the committee they wanted to serve on. So he, of course, wanted Arkansas to have somebody on House Appropriations because that's how we get our money. And uh, he, but he couldn't get Thornton on uh, appropriations that year because a member of Congress with 10 years seniority wanted that position. So that was kind of automatic. So Congressman Thornton had been Attorney General of Arkansas. So, and he was a lawyer, graduated from Yale Law School and University of Arkansas Law School. Very highly educated. He had been president of the student body at the U of A. He was called Cowboy Ray because he always wore a cowboy hat. And he was from Sheridan, Arkansas. Anyway, so 
Congressman Thornton is told by Mr. Mills, sorry, I couldn't get you on appropriations. You're on Judiciary Committee. And Congressman Thornton turns to me and he says, Kate, you know, what in the world does Judiciary Committee do? I said, I'll read about the history and give you a report. So I did. I said, well, they deal with busing. This was in the 70s. They deal with busing. They deal with abortion. And they deal with impeachment. And he said, oh, my God. He said, I'll be defeated after my first term if I have to take votes on all of those every day. So I said, well, you know, maybe, maybe not, maybe not. So we proceed. And sure enough, in the first year we were there, President Nixon, especially during the latter part of 1973, fired several people and, you know, got rid of the Attorney General, the Solicitor General, and the Deputy Attorney General. And uh, so, Quickly, impeachment was the big discussion, and he, he was shaking, Mr. Thornton was miserable. He was shaking his head, you know, I, I don't want to do, I don't want to do this. This is just, this is too hard. And uh, eventually, in 74, they had the vote, and several Southerners, uh, three or four, voted for impeachment, but the whole committee voted for it. So it wasn't like real controversial, but it was hard for Mr. Thornton. And for the rest of his career and the rest of his life, the speech that he made and the vote that he took and the, his reasons for doing it uh, were his legacy and in his obit when he passed a couple of years ago. And um, so anyway, Shortly after that, Congressman Mills moved back to Arkansas. So my husband uh, moved back because he was offered a position of vice president of Worth and Bank in Little Rock. So he was born in North Little Rock. So we moved back to Central Arkansas. His mother was in her 80s by that time, and we wanted to be close to her. And my parents had died before I left to go to Washington. So um, we kept our farm, which we still have to this day which my daughter and grandson and I, uh, to some extent, my grandson uh, is two years old, uh, run and operate. Um, but we moved back to Little Rock. He went to Wortham Bank. And uh, after uh, like two days after I had delivered Susan, I went to UALR for a job interview to teach. And uh, so they asked me to teach a couple of classes in political science. and. Uh, so everything was going really well. And um, Bill Clinton was, he had just run for Congress in 74 and lost by 2%, I believe it was. And he was running for attorney general. So uh, we helped him with that. And um, Gene took a job in a couple of years as vice president operating officer with the Arkansas Oil Marketers Association. And I was um, working several jobs. I was research director for the Constitutional Convention. And I was a project manager for a school finance study for the state legislature, the Senate and House uh, Education Committees. And I worked for a while with the Association of Arkansas Counties on as project manager. And then when uh, my friend Julia Hughes-Jones was elected state auditor, I became chief deputy state auditor. And then when President Clinton made his comeback in 1982, I went on his transition staff. And um, in 83, I became his senior assistant for intergovernmental relations. And it was to manage our relationship with the White House and Congress as a state, and also other states and organizations like the National Governors Association, the Southern Growth Policies Board, uh, the Education Commission of the States, um, those kinds of things, as well as in, within the state, the relationship with city, 
officials, county officials, city employees, county employees, federal offices that were within Arkansas. And uh, the federal executive board, the top person in every federal agency located in Arkansas met regularly in Little Rock. So I did outreach with them and uh, our congressional offices and uh, White House, uh, generally Congress, and just uh, matters that would help Arkansas. And um, so along the way, he, as while he's making those assignments, he tells us that, uh, you know, he's really looking forward to this. He hopes to work really hard. And he said he works around the clock 24 hours a day, which we found to be the case. And uh, so we should be available on the phone or whatever. It didn't do email so much back then in the 80s. But uh, so anyway, we get to the door of the governor's conference room and he says, wait, 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 come back. Everybody has to come back. So we go back in and uh, it, the question is, who wants to be my liaison to the State Office of Emergency Services? Well, none of us even knew it existed, much less wanted to be the liaison to it. It was very low profile. So no one volunteered. And he looked at me and he said, okay, you're gonna have to do it because you're already doing, uh, you're already coordinating with all these other people that are gonna be working on this. And so I just so I kind of took a deep breath and he said, and also, um, during, while I was working with the Association of Arkansas Counties, a friend of mine who had worked for me at the Constitutional Convention had been assigned to local services at State, uh, State Department of Local Services. And one of her jobs was to look at research combining the local fire retirement systems and, and police retirement systems and take them away from essentially local governments and make them a state plan so they would be solvent. And this was kind of controversial with mayors and county judges, for example. So it was a delicate situation. She asked me to help her, so I volunteered and did and worked with her on that. He said, besides that, you know all of these firefighters and all these police officers. And I was on his transition team, and during that transition, all of these police and firefighters were coming into my office all of the time to tell me what was going on and what they needed, what was going wrong, and what they wanted the governor to do. So he said, you already, talk to these people all the time. So this is just gonna be right. So he handed me a copy of the state plan, state emergency plan. And so I was known as a nerd. And so I told him, I'll take it home and I'll read it tonight. He said, you, he was laughing, falling off his chair laughing. He said, you probably will. You'll be the only person who's ever read it. So I took it home and I discovered that it had been copied from Missouri. And I said, you know what, this is not, I like an Arkansas originating plan. This is like a, I don't know if it's a template or what, but they have the word Missouri in it several times. He said, oh my goodness. Well, you know what you're going to have to do? And this is like, I had many important conversations with him, but this was probably the key. He said, okay, you're going to have to set up regional hearings and go around the state. And you're going to have to invite all the mayors and the county judges in these different regions and you're by all the firefighters and all the police, and you're gonna to have to find out what they think needs to be in a state plan. Well, it was, I was daunted. I had all these other jobs to do, and then I had to do this. And I never set up regional hearings, so how do I do it? And will people wanna come? And especially since it's not the governor coming, but it's this unknown person in his office. And uh, so, I sent out, I made phone calls. I made, I must have made a thousand phone calls that first year, getting people to come to these hearings and they would come and then kind of word spread. This person from the governor's office really wants to listen to us. And uh, so after about four months, I had been around the state. And so he asked me to give him kind of a survey of findings and I put together kind of an outline of state plan. 
And he said, oh, this is exactly what we need. And he said, so now you can flesh it out and let's have this as our state plan. And, uh, and I thought, you know, this is amazing because I knew nothing about emergency management. I didn't even know it actually existed. And I found out later that it didn't really exist, but that's another story. So we go forward with this plan and we go forward with everything. And there's a tornado in Clinton, Arkansas. And so I'm arranging this visit and it's like Christmas Eve and it's 75 degrees. So, you know, we're in for trouble anyway, when something like that happens all of a sudden. And uh, so the tornado came through and it wiped out all the historic downtown Clinton, Arkansas. So the governor goes and it is amazing. So we put together this um, application to FEMA for assistance and they turn us down. And then we appeal it and they turn us down again. So the legislature's in session. So the governor asked them to appropriate money, which they were happy to do. The county gave money, the city gave money, some well-fixed uh, financially uh, citizens of Clinton uh, gave money, some nonprofit organizations in Clinton gave money, and the citizens rebuilt the downtown area, historically preserved in the way it had been before. And in April, a flood comes through Clinton and washes out all the recovery. And it's heartbreaking. And so the governor and I are talking about what are we going to do and how are we going to get FEMA's attention? And the governor comes up with a genius idea. So what we can do is we will invite all of the federal agencies, the Corps of Engineers. We will invite everyone to come and they will all tell us what can be done with to help Clinton recover from this. Among them, we'll invite FEMA. So, and Kate, you're going to, I have other obligations that day. You're gonna to have to chair the town hall meeting. And I thought, oh geez. And um, our mayor of Clinton tells me that he thinks a thousand people will show up. So I say to the governor, you know, I have a genius of an idea. I said, you, yeah, you always have genius ideas. What's this one? So I said, what if I get Senator Bumpers to co-chair with me because he's on the Appropriations Committee for FEMA? And he said, oh, that is a genius of an idea. And um, so Senator Bumpers was more than happy to do it. So on the day of the hearing, I drive to Clinton and uh, Senator Bumpers and I have lunch together so we get our story straight and we get our strategy straight. And uh, so we open it up and uh, I make a statement and uh, Senator makes a statement. And then we ask uh, for comments from the audience and practically everybody there had something to say. But, but we had all of the agencies taking notes on that and to talk about how they could respond to the needs of the community. And it was the most positive, amazing meeting I think I've ever been in. Of course, I was probably so relieved that it turned out to be so positive. But uh, driving back the 100 miles or so from Clinton to Little Rock, and I say, hmm, this is, I like this part of my job better than I do any other part of my job. And you know, you have to fall in love with something in order to really be so passionate about it day to day. And uh, so to this day, I am that passionate about it. But fast forward then when he was elected president after 12 years as governor, um, he named me as the number two person, the associate, uh, FEMA administrator, and um, he and uh, Director Witt put together the uh, directorate, which made it really the educator of the agency. It was 
preparedness, which includes, you know, planning, but it also includes higher education. And I actually was able to initiate something that had not existed before, and that's a FEMA higher education program. There were a couple of correspondent programs in emergency management at the time, but not anything else. And so I set a goal for bringing on one degree program per year while we were in office, hoping to get one in every state by the time we would leave there in 2001. And uh, that goal was accomplished. And do you know, from that time I launched it to this day, one of those new programs is launched a month. So now there are over 600 such programs across the country that offer either degrees or professional certificates uh, in those. And they're at the bachelor's level, master's level, and PhD level. So that's uh, one of the things that I'm most proud of of my tenure at FEMA. We also launched a standards program and of course, uh, we integrated technology into emergency management for the first time, things like that. And with COVID on our minds, um, one of the responsibilities I had was the National Defense Production Act. And uh, we uh, exercised dealing with a pandemic every year. And um, so I don't know if that, was done every year thereafter at FEMA, but for those eight years, uh, we did that. And uh, we actually, at one point, because it was, the National Defense Production Act was written during a time of the Cold War. So it was a different attitude toward the world. And um, we actually uh, had a role in rewriting it so that it was more current, let's say and oriented toward things like pandemics rather than bombs from Russia. So let's see, I'm trying to think if there are other things that I should mention, but I'm sure in our discussion, we can talk about other things. You'll be tired of hearing me blab at this point. <laughs> I can talk about um, the great people who have changed my life, but mostly it all came together for me uh, right there in Fayetteville, Arkansas at the university in Fulbright College, named for our friend. <laughs> That's awesome. Do you want to take some questions, Kay? I would love to, yes. Okay, if you all want to, you can post them in the chat and I will um, relay them to Kay, or if you wanna unmute yourself and ask a question, you're more than welcome to do that too. Okay, Regina Hopper has a question for you. Oh, Regina, <laughs> hi. She said, can you give us your impressions on how, what you set up at FEMA and how things are going, or how things are progressing now? <laughs> <laughs> well, of course. Uh, you know, nothing's ever as good as if you're doing it yourself, right? Uh, I really, 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 really like the administrator of FEMA, uh, Pete Gaynor. Uh, and I'll tell you why I do, because, you know, one of the challenges I had being one of the first emergency managers in the country and uh, close to the first female, um, is that he is very, very professional. So he was a military person, and then he um, became emergency manager for the city of Providence, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Providence, he became a certified emergency manager, which is a kind of laborious process that you go through in an application and a test and, uh, you know, credentials that you have to present that you participated in an exercise and that you put together a plan and, and all kinds of uh, documentation. But he went through that process and he also went through the process called Emergency Management Accreditation Program, EMAP for short. You know, we have to have an acronym for every 
uh, for everything we do in, in emergency management, it seems. And uh, this is a program that we launched in uh, for the first time in 1997. We did set up standards for states in, in their emergency management programs. And uh, so, um, I was asked to speak at the National Emergency Management Association and make them two promises. And if, if I made them those promises, state directors in emergency management in all 50 states would back my effort. And so I made them the two promises. The two promises were one, that uh, grant funds would not be determined by the scores they made on the evaluation. And secondly, that I would not talk about how states did on it. Like I would not say, Arkansas did better than the next 15 states, which include Massachusetts and New York or something like that. Anyway, I wouldn't, I wouldn't reveal results. And so that was easy because there was never any plan to do that anyway. And, uh, and I almost fainted when I finished my speech and uh, the director from North Carolina stood up and said, I'd make a motion that we not only adopt this process, but that we support standards going forward. That had been something that state directors had fought for 20 years at that point. So um, that was kind of exciting and we did it and the states did pretty well. And we found the results were that the states that had REP programs, radiological emergency preparedness programs and chemical emergency preparedness programs, which got extra money to, for preparing the communities around like Pine Bluff, Arkansas, mm -hmm. that had all the germ and agents, chemical agents, mm -hmm. and all of those nine sites. And then the states that had uh, radiological or nuclear plants had all the money spent on their preparedness. Those states that had REP programs and CSEP programs did better than the other states. And so it showed that those programs were actually working and we were in charge of those. Um, although I was always glad that the people in Pine Bluff never figured out that I was in charge of a program that was gonna be um, doing away with their plant down there. Regina has a follow-up question for you too. Okay. She said, um, she wants to know how you feel about transportation in the logistical supply chain and how it fits into FEMA's authority in this kind of crisis. Right, so FEMA has uh, 15 emergency support functions and they're listed in priority. And emer emergency function support function number one is transportation because everything that FEMA provides in every disaster depends upon whether or not it can be transported. Mm -hmm. So the U.S. Department of Transportation and the State Departments of Transportation are really the legs of FEMA's responses. And uh, I, learned, I learned transportation from Regina's father, Bobby Hopper, who was highway commissioner. And uh, when we, uh, 1983, when we made the comeback, um, Governor Clinton and the head of the highway department, Henry Gray, were fighting each other. So we didn't, we couldn't go through the head of the department. We had to go through Bobby to get things done. And so although he was the highway commissioner for Northwest Arkansas, he served the whole state because we had projects for him that we only trusted him to do. And, uh, you know, in a few years, her father, Bobby, was able to get us back in good stead with uh, Henry Gray a little bit better. And then eventually Henry Gray retired and Maurice Smith, the governor's buddy, became, and Bobby's buddy became the chair or the director of the department. And Bobby became chair of the commission. So we were sailing then, get good things on highways for our Kansans. Awesome, she says, thank you very much. Yes. And then we have one from Patty. Um, Patty asks, after all you've seen and experienced, what kind, what do you keep in your personal emergency kit at home? 
<laughs> I, uh, oh, okay, so uh, my daughter has a son that she had in 2018. And so in 2018, she told me that I have to get rid of the car that I was driving. Um, Congressman Mills had this car. And so one day he said, come with me, Kay, you need to get a new car. So I went with him to the agency and Cersei, and he said to that guy, he said, you know, Kay needs a new car. She can't afford a new car. So I want a new car and I want you to charge me enough for the new car that, so that she can afford uh, to get a new car, get by this car. And so I don't know, it had like 15, 20,000 miles on it. And uh, Dwayne Treat, who was the uh, manager at uh, the Lincoln Mercury dealer, put something together so, so that I could buy the car for $25,000. The Bank of Kensett financed it at 10% interest because uh, I, my salary in the governor's office, I think was 33 or 35,000. It wasn't, it, anyway, it wasn't too much. And uh, to be driving a Lincoln Town car. And uh, so I got that car and uh, <laughs> I drove it for 25 years. It, or 26 years, it was 2018, and I still have it, and it's like 250,000 miles on it or something. Anyway, it was a fine car. My daughter says, you're not driving my son around in that car, because <laughs> the air conditioning quit working. That was a big detail. And so I bought her a new car, and I took over a car I'd bought for her back in 2003, uh, both Ford Explorers. And so I had to clean out my car, and I found I had five safety kits in my car <laughs> and i had them in the back seat i had them in the front seat i had them in the trunk and some of them were kits had been given to me some i put together but over that 25 years of emergency management i had kits and so i got rid of those kits and i have to admit that for two years i've had not had a kit <laughs> So I'm not setting a very good example anymore. That's okay. <laughs> I overdid it for a while now. I underdid it, which is the story of my life, I guess. Well, does anyone else have any questions? I have one question. Okay, yeah, yeah. whether it's dealing with uh, county judges like Bobby Woodard and Clinton or Alan Dodson in Faulkner County after the oil spill, what have you learned in terms of resilience for helping uh, support the sheriff's officer, county judges, and, and recovering from these long hours that they spend on, on disaster re responses? Yes, you know, I have uh, become such a great advocate of PTSD counseling. And I think, I remember the first time we ever offered crisis counseling uh, at FEMA was uh, to, <coughs> let's see, 1995. It was after the Oklahoma City uh, bombing. And uh, we had a police officer who was presented with it. Uh, actually, uh, Tipper Gore Rick, had a son who had mental health issues. And she was a big advocate of crisis counseling. And so she said, she called the president and uh, director Witt and said, you know, we need to, FEMA needs to be offering crisis counseling. So we started offering it at that time. But um, we had a police officer who was, who had a lot of press coverage and uh, it was like making him a real hero because he was rescuing a lot of those kids that had been shot and some of that just injured or some of that were just scared to death out of that daycare center that was in the basement of the federal building, Murrah building in Oklahoma City. And um, so he, we offered him crisis counseling and he said, no, I don't need it. I was trained to do this job. This is what I wanted to do. I did a good job of it. I, I'm fine, don't, don't worry about me. And then, 
his department said that he started showing up drunk and then he started using drugs and then and his wife divorced him and then he lost custody of his kids and then he committed suicide mm -hmm. and it was really fast it was within a year after that incident that, that happened and so after that we changed it and we made it so that it was not just 10 sessions and it was not if you would like to take these it was mandatory and as long as you need them, you can have them. And, and so I think that that's what we need to be emphasizing today as well. I think um, I have a grandson uh, from my stepdaughter who was in the Virginia Tech shooting in 2007. And now it's 2020, so 13 years later, he's still getting crisis counseling about that event. And he serves on the board of the uh, Virginia Tech Families Foundation. So they're trying to provide crisis counseling to students on campus that have PTSD. I think work with PTSD and with the terrible uh, situations that uh, many of the first responders and sheriffs and um, especially EMTs, paramedics, nurses, um, uh, that whole, and I actually been in touch with Pete Gaynor uh, to tell him that I think crisis counseling needs to now be offered to those healthcare workers as well as our emergency responders and, and law enforcement. Mm -hmm. That's great. Does anyone else have a question? Uh, I'd like to just say uh, to, to Kay, thank you for sharing these stories. It's, uh, it's always um, good to hear of your experience, but also how you um, put the, the commitment and the heart you bring to, to what you do at the university, as well as other fields that you're involved with. And um, I think there are many lessons that we need today um, dealing with the stresses of this situation where with the COVID virus and, and all, but uh, um, it's, um, it's, it's always reassuring to hear of uh, someone who's, uh, who's been able to, to put those practices into place in, in their lives and, and to provide leadership in that field. Thank you so much, Steve. It's great working with you and, our group of Fulbright College. Thank you. And sharing uh, the great Commonwealth with you. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, we, did get to have, also. we didn't get to have our party. We'll have to do that. <laughs> right. We'll have to reschedule. Yes. We'll do one more question and then wrap it up. Um, Florence has asked, she said, what resources do you recommend to start finding crisis counseling and where would someone begin with that? Well, let me ask if uh, I can give her my email address. I'd like to drill down on what the actual situation is um, and probably needs to be private. Mm -hmm. So just uh, Mary Kate, if you would, uh, can you send her my email? That'd be will. great. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you so, so much, Ms. Goss. We appreciate this more than you know, and um, thank you everyone for tuning in.